Welcome to See You on the Other Side, where the world of the mysterious collides with the world of entertainment. A discussion of art, music, movies, spirituality, the weird, and self-discovery. And now, your hosts, musicians and entertainers who have their own weakness for the weird, Mike and Wendy from the band Sunspot. Welcome back. We're home. We're in Wisconsin. Yes. We're not in California anymore. Yeah, back to, <laughs> and it's been nice weather, so I'm not going to complain. Oh, gosh. Yeah, it's like summer came. Mm-hmm. It was here for the weekend, and now it's winter right. again. Yep, it's gone. <laughs> it's back like 40 degrees today. So, this, we, well, we got... We, no, it's fine. I'm not complaining. It's been great. Mm-hmm. I think I think we're over the worst of it. So. Yes. Yes. So, anyway, there hasn't been any paranormal weather over no, here so far. No, no. No time travel fog. Nothing like that. No weird clouds. Nope. But something fun about Wisconsin that we're doing right now is the Madison Area Music Association <laughs> Awards. It's so fun. Called the Mamas. And the reason why <laughs> it's fun is because um, you guys could actually help put instruments in kids' hands and help out with music education in the Madison area and also do us a real solid. Yeah. We've, uh, we've talked about it before, Madison Area Music Association Awards. Yes. And your votes got us into the final yes thank you so much and uh, we did hear from a lot of you who said you voted for us so we appreciate you get the credit for us making it into round two and we really really appreciate it if you voted for round one you can vote for round two you don't have to pay again your your money went into the good cause and now it's just for us (laughs) now now you're just doing it because you're a kind-hearted good person and so we we really like kind-hearted good people and if you want to continue to be one just go on for round two yeah. and go in and vote for Sunspot. And then if you didn't vote for round one, you can still donate money yep. and, and show you the warmth of your heart. And the warmth is, it's it's only a $5 warmth of your heart. Yeah. So you don't have to worry like it's going to be draining out or anything. It's, it's, right. it's five bucks. The music goes completely to the charity, 100%. The money. Of the money all goes, of the proceeds right goes right to the charity yeah. to help children uh, learn more about music in Madison, in the Madison, Wisconsin area. And it, it really is a, is a great program that we've supported wholeheartedly yeah. for the past decade. we have and we've seen the good results from it too we've seen students that have come up and have, like benefited from Absolutely. that particular charity so and then we've seen them at like shows and stuff right like so it's like <laughs> it's awesome. the next generation <laughs> and how to be awesome rockers so uh we'll have links to that up in the show notes at othersidepodcast.com slash 91 um but we absolutely appreciate it. if you've already voted please go in and vote round two it doesn't cost you anything uh and we have the we'll have the categories at OthersidePodcast.com slash 91. If you haven't had a chance to vote yet, don't worry, my friends. It's okay. It is not too late. You can do that today. That's we'll right. That and we're in a few categories, so hopefully at least one of those maybe will yeah. get an award. That would be right. neat. And so it's fun, and it's just, a, it's just a fun way to do something cool for charity. And of course, yes. it's tax, your $5 is taxed. Yes. So that means you can, better. you can stick it to the man, too, <laughs> at the same time. It's helping out a band and helping out That's kids. right. Good stuff. Yes. So what else is going on this week, Mike? It's uh, This oh. is going to be Friday the 13th coming up. It is going to be Friday oh. the 13th. Yes, yeah. yes. Yep, that's the first Friday the 13th of the year. And mm. we are going to be running a haunted history tour in Madison. All right, and excellent. And so you can see that at madisonghostwalks.com. Um, some new stories on that. So if you guys have gone on it before, you're going to see some brand new stuff. Cool. And it's the inaugural St. Paul Ghost Walk. Hey! So yeah, I've been talking about it for the past couple of months. Congratulations! Thank you very much. But now it is launching this Friday. Uh, the stories are done. The route is done. Exciting! The, uh, you know, the guides have walked it and stuff like that. They've gone over the stories, and it's going to be really fun. So Friday the thirteenth, eight p.m. St. Paul dot com, and that will be in the uh, show notes as well. But you and I are going to be in the Twin Cities this week. Yeah, we're going to be we're going to be up there. Something different we haven't done before. Yes. The, uh, the Paradigm Symposium. Ooh. And uh, there's going to be a lot of... Uh, the, first of all, the keynote speaker is Travis Walton from Fire in the Sky. Excellent. So he's going to... That's so cool. Yeah. And I, I've heard interviews before. He's a really cool guy. So we're looking forward to meeting him in person. That's great. And um, so Travis Walton's going to be there. Nick Redfern is like a monster hunter that I... He's one of my favorites. Cool. He's like this, he's like this English guy that lives in Texas now uh, in Dallas. And I've read all of his books. Wow. And actually one time... Went to the UK. I took along his book, Three Men Seeking Monsters. Uh-huh. And it's these different places that they go oh, in cool. the UK to search for like legendary uh, British. So you used it as a cryptid. trip guide. A little oh. bit of a trip guide. Fun. It's like, okay, it's like we're in this area. Let's go see where they went and things they checked out. Mm-hmm. Let's do that too. Cool. So uh, Nick Redfern's there. 
And I mean, it, it is the who's who <laughs> of the paranormal at the Paradigm Symposium. Great. That's so going to be super fun. And you guys will hear as we bug people there. Yeah. yeah and it'll, uh, it'll be like you're with us bugging people. And if you're there, find us. Yes. And say hello. I don't, I don't, there's not going to be like a thousand people there. So you'll probably meet us over one of the days. Um, Mike oh, and Wendy okay. from, yeah. yeah. You know what we look like. Just check the website if. Yeah. At the Par- <laughs> but we'll be at the Paradigm Symposium. Hanging out, talking to people, checking it out, mixing and matching with the fine people of the Twin Cities. I can't wait. Yep. The fine weirdos up there. We're looking That's forward gonna to That's going to be... Oh, I'm really pumped for that. Yes. So the interview this week, funny enough, is a guy we talked about in a previous podcast. Oh. Because we checked out his presentation and his stuff at the uh, Chicago right. Ghost Convention. Yep. And really interesting guy. Like we talked about like he had a cool hat, like a cowboy yeah, look. Yeah, you guys everything. were excited about that. Like that he was... He, I mean, not not the not the cowboy hat, but <laughs> right. But the fact that it was another visually interesting person to look mm. at the thing. Very uh, had a cool visual style, and uh, was a really interesting speaker. Another English guy, and just fun to listen to, and and a cool producer. Awesome. I had a really great conversation with him the other day as we talked about the latest stuff he's doing, and also his personal brushes with the paranormal Ooh. and how that's influenced his filmmaking work. Okay. Well, why don't we take a listen? See you on the other side. I'm here with film producer Christopher Saint Booth, who, uh, you know, I'm Facebook friends with this guy, and I got to say, he might rival that dude from the Dos Equis commercials for the, the title of the most interesting man in the world, because I always see him doing awesome stuff. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today, Christopher. Well, thank you very much. Well, that chap's out of work now, so <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a good thing. <laughs> no, but at the same time, they're looking for somebody to replace him, so that's something you, you, you might want to consider. Okay, uh, so for people who might be unfamiliar with your work so far, can you give a, a list, of, a, a couple of the, the titles you've had um, a privilege to be part of and some works you've recently done in the paranormal field? Well, we're... Basically, um, me and my brother are film producers and directors for the Sci-Fi Channel. Um, Most recently, Discovery and Destination America, Chiller, which is an NBC channel. Mm -hmm. And uh, we run our own company, distribute our own products on Amazon and Vimeo and Redbox and, you know, the the whole concept of distribution. And basically, we do nothing but paranormal and scary stuff, which makes it very fascinating because we're constantly in search of a you know, a new idea or a new uh, new way to look at something that's already possibly been already put out there and finding out the truth. So it's, it's a very incredible adventure. We're involved in also the music business as well as um, feature films as well. And so that was something that I was also interested in asking you about as well, because I was into music. I've been playing in a band for what feels like 100 years. And before I kind of got into this field and started writing haunted history tours and started doing these podcasts, and this is episode 91, so if you're listening at home, you can hear the show notes and see a picture of Christopher's face and stuff like that. Othersidepodcast.com slash 91 is where you can find that. And um, so, you you know, you originally were a musician, right? When I was looking you up and everything, um, the name of your band was, you were in a band called Sweeney Todd for a while? Yeah, Sweeney Todd was a Canadian band that had um, several Juno Awards and a gold gold album out. At the time that um, I joined the band, I actually, I replaced a singer called Brian Adams. And Brian Adams went on to be, you know, the Brian Adams we all know. Right, he's done a couple of things. Yeah, he's done a few things. And I took his place as a singer. And that, that's where my professional music career started. And, of course, I ended up in Los Angeles and doing my own thing. So when you came over, so you're obviously from the UK originally. Yeah. And, uh, you know, did you, so you came over to the US to make it as a musician? How, at what age did you do that? Uh, about, well, I was, I was, I was touring in Canada when I, I, the day I turned 18, I always remember I did my first big gig in Canada. So um, that was with Sweeney Todd. And then after that, we, uh, you know, formed our own bands after that band kind of, you know, took a break. We formed our own bands. And to get to America was the only way to be bigger in the music business at that time for us anyway. So we we went down there about 20 
20, 21 years old is when I started in America in the music business. Oh, that's, that sounds like fun. We, my, um, Wendy, my drummer and I, we were just in uh, Los Angeles last week and we're back in Madison, Wisconsin this week, but it's always, it's always fun to go visit the dream factory every once in a while. And uh, you know, the entertainment business and all the um, Hollywood stuff. And, and so I can just imagine uh, getting there, working on your bands and stuff like that. And as a young man, and that must have been uh, like the realization of a dream and everything. It was a rock and roll thing. I mean, I mean, it really was. It was like when we landed, we formed, you know, we formed, a, we actually brought the band that I was in and my brother, Philip, from Seattle, which was called Alley Brat. And we brought them to LA. And then we started playing, you know, the Rainbow, the Whiskey. Uh, the Starwood at the time, Starwood's no longer, but that time was a big uh, rock and roll club. And the Troubadour, of course. And, uh, you know, we were like a big rock and roll hair glam band. I mean, I, I think we Sweet. spent more on, on hairspray than we did anything else <laughs> at the time. It was in the 80s, right? Early, early, early. Actually, late 70s, early 80s. And um, bands like... Um, uh, Motley Crue actually backed us up, which was really strange. But they weren't Motley Crue at the time that everybody, you know, they became. But Motley Crue actually backed us up. And actually, even you 2 did in a gig we did in Orange County. Oh, so that's it was awesome. Like, I know. I mean, and they were really nice people. They have to tell you that you 2 chaps were really nice. But we that's how we started. And, of course, uh, that actually, when that kind of ran out of gas, due to more creative than anything, we ended up getting into the movie business. And so when you first started the, in the movie business, did, did you know that you were going to be into uh, this kind of field and the weird and unusual and supernatural and stuff? Was that, I mean, maybe we should go back a little bit and say, did you have an interest in this kind of thing from an early age? Well, no, I just, I mean, the movies you like is kind of the direction that we took it, you know? Mm -hmm. We were into Ridley Scott and... The Exorcist was probably the scariest film that I, I've ever seen and still is in, in some ways. And, of course, who would think that, oh, many, I don't even know how many, many years later that we'd actually be doing filming in the real Exorcist house, which is bizarre. Right. The scariest film I've ever seen. But um, I think we're just into, into looking at things differently. Like a musician, you know how when you write a track, you – have a tendency to be a a viewer on the side of the road and you take in what you feel is the story that you want to tell. And I think the stories that we always told were dark, you know, mm -hmm. um, and obviously that matched the horror or the supernatural vein. So that's kind of, even our first film we did was paranormal, supernatural. And that was way before we even got involved with the paranormal documentary sci-fi and different stuff like that but every film we ended up doing seemed to have ghosts in them for some reason <laughs> and i don't know why but they did well so so you didn't have something like you didn't you didn't see a ufo when you were a kid or you know a lot of people are like well i i you know it's like well why are you into this stuff and, and some people will be like well you know it's because this old woman used to come into my room at night and uh change my socks and well, when i when i asked my mom about her there was nobody there only you should mention that <laughs> we did have an have an old an older lady come into our room uh, when we were very young, Philip and I, and visitors, and we were screaming. We both saw this woman come in, and when we, you know, my mom ran in and opened the door, turned the lights on, she was gone, and we explained who she was, and my mom said, "Well, that's your grandmother," and she just passed an hour ago. Oh, so man. that was the first, I guess, real paranormal experience, though I don't think that stuck, you know, to make us want to do it. But then again, maybe it did. I don't know. But, you know, we, you know, we did. I saw UFOs when I was living in Malibu and I wrote, you know, obviously in my I have a book called Paranoia, which actually goes through um, like 10 years and 30 different uh, cases of that I've been involved in. And right from since I was young, but kind of explains all the creepiness that I went through. And of course, it's kind of my point of view of how the real life works with the afterlife. But 
I think um, just having a different point of view is is like being sensitive, and then and that is opens you up to paranormal experience. Well, I think so too, and you'll you'll notice that uh, I think that um, more of the people who have tend to have experiences uh, tend to be the the creative artistic types. Yeah, definitely. Like you know, women are definitely more sensitive, and and, mm-hmm. and gentlemen that are gay are obviously more sensitive, and. And everybody that is like an artist, a writer, a poet, a painter, an actor, anybody has to use emotion to communicate um, or more emotion to communicate is, I think, is going to be open to what people can't see. Because then what it's open to is what people feel. And then when, what you feel is where the afterlife comes in. Because, you know, nine out of ten times you feel something before you ever see it. Mm-hmm. That's if you're lucky to ever see it. And I think that's a great, you know, that's a, I think that's a great way to put it. If you deal in a, um, an art form where, I mean, a lot of it is emotion where that's, you know, especially we talk about music or we talk about visual arts and things where so much of it is the feeling. And, you know, that's when a lot of people have experiences, the first thing they'll say is, well, this emotion overtook me. So it's like, if a spirit cannot communicate with you through like obviously showing up and talking or waving high or something, the one way it can communicate with you is a feeling. And, I, and so I, I think that's an awesome point. I haven't, I haven't thought about that before that, you know, communicating through feelings might be the, 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 the first step, but, but okay. So you guys start getting into filmmaking. You, you have your band, but you have a lot of hair probably. Uh, it's the eighties. It's a lot of fun. And then you kind of, you move skills. Did you start scoring films or were you guys already, uh, filmmakers while you were working on the band? Well, I mean, we were, we were always a band, even when we did mu- uh, movies. I mean, I could never, ever put that down. Phil still plays guitar. And of course I write all the music to all the productions we do. And I never put, I never gave that up. Just, one, I kind of got, I don't want to use the word bored, but maybe my creative energy. I think you would probably understand that, you know, if you're writing a lot of songs and music and then you write, you know, obviously someone you really love, then you feel like, okay, what's next? And for me, I would take a break and I would go do like photography or, you know, digital graphics. I even did a game design where I did 3D characters for a while. That's cool. I would just bounce around. I mean, I'd be in, I'd be in like basically a studio room that would have one, you know, computer setup would be 3D animation that I was working on, you know, skinning uh, 3D figures and stuff, really, you know, dark looking people. And then on the other one would be my music studio. And on the other one would be like, you know, something else I'd be doing. I'd be like in a chair that would, you know, revolve and just do all three things when I would get bored. And I just, you know, as long as I was creating, it didn't matter to me music or writing or or photography or whatever it but we also that magic thing that we all have to do is make money right <laughs> that's the that, tough part uh, i know i wasn't making too much money doing music at the very beginning after you know the big bands broke up i was basically out there like everybody else paying to play you know in the troubadour if you know the troubadour mm-hmm. in you know, santa monica that's where guns and roses just played their first reunion gig um you know when we played there and, and still to this day you have to pay for water you know and it's like you have to pay to play you have to you know guarantee so many people are going to come in and buy a drink to see your band and they'll let you play there you know and it's basically pay to play and so you aren't really making any money so in order to do that we ended up actually uh my brother's ex-wife um father was a director for the playboy channel okay so he had work like as a pa now i was actually doing pa work in other films like you know big films i was in the art department a production assistant on really big films but i wasn't making very much money at all not even 50 dollars a day and i was doing 12 hours and lifting really heavy stuff and oh, but i know God. I was learning the big business from behind the scenes. Actually, that's when it all started. I found a budget for, you know, a movie called Dreamscape, which had Eddie Albert and um, 
Dennis Quaid in it. Oh, yeah, that's a we've talked about Dreamscape, I think, three or four times on this show, too, because that's where they could launch into each other's dreams. And the guy was yeah. trying to kill the president. And that's right, yeah. Oh, I no, I, I love it. I worked on that movie. I actually was the guy who taped the lizard guy's tail on. Awesome. Uh, and, and remember the billboards of the uh, 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 the um, ap- apocalyptic uh, city when it blew up? Remember that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I moved those billboards. And, of course, you know, the Dream Center, that is um, – we had to scrape those floors. That was an old veteran's hospital. Ah. It was a the uh, 20s. We had to scrape it to make it look like a Dream Center. And which is, by the way, a lot of this stuff is in my book, Paranoia, because I had paranormal experiences working there, actually. Um, there was a veteran that was um, an escaped veteran from the new hospital, ran into the old hospital, and was in the in the basement yelling, I didn't mean to kill you, Joe. I didn't mean to kill you. And freaky stuff started going oh, on. Man. I mean, all this crap started going on. But meanwhile, we were, you know, that wasn't paying very well, so... We were offered one hundred and twenty-five dollars a day to do whatever we needed to do for Playboy, which is basically pick up the food or, you know, get the dry cleaning or whatever they did. You see, now that's the kind of movie I would pay to play to be on. <laughs> well, you know, we all thought that at the beginning. <laughs> of course, it plays with your psyche because um, being what I think I'm more of a gentleman or romantic. Sure. I was seeing some horrific stuff. Not necessarily from the classy films, but, you know, other people would hire me to work on their movies, which were truly um, serious porno. And it was horrible to watch for me because it was very um, against what I felt. You know, I wasn't a prude. It's just I had, you know, I was a guy who was like running around the set, giving them their robes to put on because the girls would walk around naked all the time. Someone would go with them. And I thought. You know, there's a time to get professional, take your clothes off, but there's a time to put them back on too, you know? Mm-hmm. But um, meanwhile, to make a long story, we did that for a while. And uh, because of our, our visions of, of music and movies, we were asked to make a film. And then we started making movies for Playboy. We actually did 86 films for Playboy. Wow, and, that's a that's and, a that's a, that's like somebody's total career right there, and that you know was just a few years for you. Yeah, we did. We actually did that in the three years. We made eighty six films in three years. Um, and oh, you guys got to months. you guys get to write them and everything. Uh, Phil wrote them, and they were very romantic. They at that time Playboy. It was back in the eighties, so Playboy needed a reason to show nudity. So the only way you could do that on even on cable television, was to have a really good story. Sure. And to have good production value. So And you, you can know, have I really think, sexy you can have really sexy romantic films, you know, too, in, in like nine and a half weeks and things like that. Could yeah, they could ride the edge of that well, and be a good movie. Yeah, that's what we did actually. We turned these Playboy films into erotic thrillers, basically. Because actually after I noticed because um I even did the music for them. So it's like I got when I get in royalty checks they turned every one of the films we did into erotic thriller because it was so story driven and so all of that. But anyway, we got, basically we really learned how to make movies at that point because we were doing two a month, but the business was starting to get really seedy and the people were getting seedy and the story and the romantic part of it was going out and it was just getting down to basically, you know, um, one guy filming himself with 12 girls kind of thing. Right. It was just where, where porno became not art anymore. Like in, in, in Europe, porno is art. And in America, art is porno. And, um, you know, it just became very um, hardcore. And I started feeling very shameful, I guess, about myself and my soul. And I was watching the young girls, you know, um, well, I mean, be, be de- you know, it's a it's one thing to be an degraded. actress and stuff like that, but it's another thing to be degraded. I've had some friends that were photographers and visual artists where they were like, "Hey, in the beginning it was great," and then they were like, "Too much exposure to a uh, something that th- th- didn't feel it was good for their spirits." Yeah, it, it was getting to it wasn't sitting good with my psyche. So Philip and I said, "We've got to get out." Was you know, we really you know, we were pretending ourselves too that we were making movies. 
this is really in our beginning of our career. You know, we were pretending we're making good money, but we were pretending. And when it came down to, we really didn't make a real film. So we said we got we got to call it. So we quit, and we took the money we had earned, and we made our first horror film, which was Dark Place. At that time, it was called Shadowbox. Changed its name to Dark Place, and that starred a, a gentleman, rest in peace, Matthew McGorry, who is the giant in um, Thousand Corpses there and uh, Devil's Reject. He oh, played cool. Me. Yeah, he was basically our main actor in it, but it was the only movie that he didn't have to wear makeup in, and we let him do dialogue because he was a very beautiful, you know, different individual. Sure. And he was great. He was great. I loved him, and we became really good friends. But Well, right it's, like after- the, it's like the guy from... Um- Michael Berryman from uh, the Hills of yeah. Eyes or whatever. Like you, you know, you meet him in person or whatever, just like a regular dude. Whenever you see him in the movie, you know, they always, it's, so it's nice to be able to let those people, their natural look kind of shine through. I filmed a movie with him. I'm, I did a movie called Solar Fire, which had him and Charlton Heston. In. Awesome. And, yeah. He played and, and the late Jack Palance, which was beautiful. How were they? Um, I mean, this is a sidetrack, but Charlton Heston and Jack Palance on the set. I mean, they are, that's about as old classic Hollywood as you can get. Well, unfortunately, Charlton had a drinking problem. Oh. And he was very drunk. Jack Palance was incredible. He was, he would, um, I actually was, I was, I was the music um, designer of the props. And, um, I designed all the futuristic uh, musical instruments. Oh, in the fun. Space bar. And um, then they put me into the film. This is all in my book, by the way. Then they put me in the film because they thought I looked like a scruffy Mad Max at the time. <laughs> so I don't know if that was a compliment or an insult, but they put me in there. And of course, Jack Powers would come up and pull this digital trumpet out of my hand and, and just play in between takes. He was a very nice man. And Michael Berryman played. Um, I guess the mutant, which is what he's pretty much used to playing. Right. In that movie. That's why I first met Michael, because Michael has a beautiful Playboy wife, which is, uh, you know, which he didn't really think was going to happen in right. some sense. But he did. It was, he was a nice guy, nice chap. But anyway, um, like all that dried up, but we went ahead and made that film, and it's called Dark Place, and we released it. And it did really well in Europe, but it didn't do do very much in America. And that was the time that the movie Saw was put out. And those movies, the first Saw came out, was right when we released our film. So horror was going into more of a different direction. I, I personally liked the first Saw movie. And then after that, it became very, um, you know, torture porn. Right. In a way. Right. The, the first, first one's pretty clever. first one was really good. It looked great, too. So, um, you know, with that in mind, we ended up... Uh, doing trailers for a living. We would make everybody's film trailer look better. When they, when they would make a trailer, they, could, they couldn't sell it. So they'd bring it to us, and we would put our pizzazz. Because so that's what we've been doing you know, for Playboy for a long time, was making these nothing films into look like big-budget productions. Sure. You know? So after that, we met somebody who said, you want to make another movie? We said, yeah. And he said, well, I want to make a movie about um, a pirates and an art heist in this big mu- old museum that they've got these, you know, these uh, rare paintings and these people going to steal them. And I go, okay, well, what's the place called that you want to film it at? Because, you know, if you get a good location, you can make a film cheaper. Mm-hmm. He goes, it's at Waverly Hill Sanatorium. And I went, okay, what is that? So at that point, I did a lot of research. Right. And, at- that place is incredibly haunted. And I found out what the place really was. And at that point, I turned back to the other producer and I said, you're not going to write no bloody art film. <laughs> what you're going to write is what really happened at Waverly and what the locals are calling their monster. And we wrote the script over it, the history and the hauntings of Waverly Sanatorium, and that became Death Tunnel. And that was released by Sony Pictures. And that was our first major movie after Dark Place that we released. And that did pretty well. It actually turned out to be a cult film. Um, and so how, ten, how ten close did you keep that to history? 
Like, um, well, a lot of people, you know, there's a few people mocking it because you know you have the, you know the, you know the typical teenage initiation, which is very typical. That wasn't really part of the script that that I wrote. That was actually the other producer that had written that part in it. But I'm glad he did because actually making it more, you know, college teenage orientated was the reason probably why Sony even picked it up. Sure. I mean, you got to figure when you're making something, you've got to have somebody to buy it. Otherwise, it's a movie. I see so many people making movies, and I just kind of go, I sure hope you've got someone to buy it after you make it. You know, because everybody's going out, you know, okay, even throwing it on Netflix now is not success. Everybody throws it on Netflix at the very end, you know? Mm-hmm. But, but um, we, all the stuff that, ha- I don't know if you've seen Death Tunnel. I haven't seen Death Tunnel yet, but now it, we'll, li- we'll link to it, and now it goes on my list. You've got to see it, because um, not only is it really dark, and, and it really is done really well, because it's, you know, the lighting is incredible, and of course I do the music, and the costumes are really great. It's about five girls that do, do initiation in Waverly Hill Sanatorium to see if they can spend the night there. And of course, you know... Things go all- poorly. They start dying, <laughs> but to to these these girls in old fashioned nineties with the, their initials Devon, Elizabeth, Ashley, Tori, Heather. Oh. Well, that's spelled <laughs> death. Right. Spelled death. Well, they you know have to get out of this asylum. So what we put in it is everything that really happened there, um, and including all the death that death that really happened there. Like there was a guy electrocuted. So one of the girls gets electrocuted. There was people that froze to death because they put him out on the balcony for fresh air in the middle of winter because of TB. So we have people freezing to death, turning to ice and stuff. And, mm. and then there was a rumor about a doctor that would push a gurney around and, and come and get the dead. So he became our, our death dude in there. So, I mean, everything in that whole movie really happened in the sense of whether it was real or a legend that was supposed to be real. So none of it was like made up. It was made up and it, it was it was based on legends and on history. So even the stuff that seems way out there actually everybody had a legend about that. And it's pretty cool, including the fact that Waverly was still taking money for dead patients at the time. Like when somebody would die you're supposed to report them so their budget, like $35 a bed at that time, right. would be taken away. They wouldn't report them so they could keep getting the money. So, so they were even crooked as well as cruel. Yeah, so even some of the dirt is really in that movie. Of course, that movie, when we were filming it, we started to huh, get apparitions and cold spots and shadow people and all crazy stuff. Real stuff started to happen when we were making the movie. I said, we better get a film crew into, in here to film us going through what we're filming. And then that turned out to be the documentary Spook, Ghost of Wave, Wave Hill Sanatorium, which Sci-Fi then released that on their channel. And you see, I and think that's, that's an incredible be- story because it's like you, you guys are working on a horror film in a place that's got haunted stories in it. And that's, that's the perfect kind of like setup for a horror, maybe a horror movie right it there. Is. Yeah, so Sci-Fi loved that idea, and and they wanted that they wanted it really bad, so they did it, and I think it's had over it's been on Sci-Fi for like five years or ten, five or six years, and that title's about what nine years old now, and about over four million people have seen it now. So it's a great film. It's, that's called Spook. You haven't seen Spook. That is a read, and that Spook is a the documentary of what happened in Waverly, and we talked to the real patients that were still alive, the doctors and the staff that were still alive, and then all the locals that would tell us the stories, the ghost hunters, the owners of Waverly, everybody that we could find. And then we go down there and film, you know, Waverly and put it all together to kind of find out what really happened there. It's beautiful, but it's also sad because we talked, in fact, a lot of the patients Unfortunately, you have passed since we've made that movie because they were in their 90s when we shot them. You know? So how did you, like the permission to shoot there, like it was already closed down. Yeah. And so 
was, I mean, you just had to get it from the, like, are the owners, did, like, the county reclaim it or something? Or, like, who owns that property? No, it was private property. The owners bought it on eBay. <laughs> and they paid they paid two hundred fifty grand for it, and um, no one had filmed there before, and so we offered them uh, a very well, at that time a large amount of money to take over the asylum for about ten days, and then you know be able to come back and film off and on for three years there, and uh, that's what we did, and um, then uh, ghost hunters went in right after we filmed and when they uh they were actually that they said they were the first to do waverly and actually we were but their show came out aired first right one hour one hour before our show they came on and i remember grant saying at the very end well this place is haunted nothing's going to top that and then our shock and then our show came on <laughs> spooked so that was cool. And as an art director, when you were there, like how much did you have to, like how, what kind of shape and condition and stuff like that is in? Because we're used to everything, like here's how it really looks and here's the, you know, the Hollywoodization of it. Like how much did you have to change or adjust or uh, to make it look like you wanted it to look in the movie? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> it looked like Tim Burton. <laughs> uh, the walls were literally warped. Um, almost in a circular, you know, like labyrinth direction. It was the peel, the paint was peeling for 80 years. It was still there. Nothing at all. In fact, we found a lot of the real props we used, the needles, the gurneys, the wheelchairs, was, some of them were still there. So no, absolutely nothing. All we did is come in, light it, bring uh, two gallons of green slime that we put dripping from everything. <laughs> And that was it. And then we brought five nineties, five sexy girls from LA, and they must have been the- loving it. And started filming. And the thing is, um, I remember when we brought the girls there, right from Beverly Hills, right? Oh, oh my, you know, <laughs> you know, like that. Right? And we drove up, and they got their mouth was dry. And they went. Oh my God! You know? What am I? Went, what did I get myself into? Yeah, like said, this is oh, going to be my way, big break if I survive. I know, and I said, and "By the way, it really is haunted." <laughs> and they died. I mean, they went, "Oh my God!" And the fear—the actually... fear was real. You didn't have to direct too much. Yeah, and there's no cure for fear at all. <laughs> so it was like um, they started getting ill when they were filming, and they got very scared. And um, they saw a lot of things. So everybody saw, I mean, truly, I mean, honestly, everybody really witnessed something weird there and went home. If they didn't, if you weren't believing in ghosts when you got there, you believed when you left. And so now getting spooked on, uh, you know, making a doc, first of all, it's brilliant that you get a making of documentary that's a paranormal documentary in addition to your your uh, fiction film, you know, your historical fiction. So number one, that's, that's a brilliant idea to get a two for one shot out of it. And, 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 and so that was like, okay, now you're a paranormal filmmaker, you know, in addition to like, okay, we have stories, we, you know, art and things like that. Like now we're doing some, uh, you know, real stuff and documentaries and things. And so what was like your next, you know, we like, did like a light bulb go off or something? You're like, man, there's a, yeah, well, like this ghost became, hunter stuff has taken off. I became a producer. So that's where it all became like, okay, now what, now what are we going to do? A producer needs to be like any artist, by the way, anybody that makes a living off of their talent should have three, at least three irons in the fire because two of them probably won't burn. And, um, that's what, you know, um, what you got to do but spook did so well um that sci-fi ordered two more immediately at a really good amount of money and um that became children of the grave about ghost orphans and the possessed the first case of possession in america in 1877 and those shows uh, went on to be the next shows for sci-fi for the next two years after that 
But more than anything, the respect level that we had inside each other was important now. Even when we were doing Playboy, we were trying to respect the craft of erotic art and, and you know, romantic turn on and try to treat everybody with respect. Mm-hmm. So that respect value came into the paranormal. And, you know, like in, in Spooked, we dealt with a lot of elderly people, which were really beautiful talking to, you know, talking to the owner the owner of Waverly's father, we asked him if he would interview. And he go, he said, yeah. So he showed up and he was in, all dressed up in a nice, he was like 80 something, dressed up in a nice little suit and a hat, in, you know, ready to be interviewed in a haunted asylum. It was like this old chap with a cane walking down the middle of a haunted hallway. And it was so cool and beautiful. So when we went on to Children on the Grave, it was time to respect the children that we were trying to help basically tell the stories. And I think that's, I think I love the point you're making there because I think that's something that, um, you know, is, is more recent, especially in paranormal documentaries and things like that. when you talk about the producer being the artist and artists in general, you know, the respecting the craft and doing your best and, you know, doing your best to make it something special and not sensational and not, I mean, because if, if you're going to do a half-ass job or something like that, or just, you know, do it just to get it done or something, then you might as well just be doing an e- a day job or something easy or something like that. And it, it's that respect of, I want to do this because I believe in it. Cause I think about something. I want to make it special. I want to make sure the people I deal with are treated well and that the whole experience is something that's pleasant and fun and, and things like that and, and important and artistic. I think that's what separates like the artist from the, you know, the, the sausage maker. Well, it does. I mean, when I was, you know, crazy, I did a music video um, back in the 80s. I played Jesus. And what was difficult was to play Jesus in a music video and also be the producer, which means you've got to <laughs> keep everything on budget. So here I am saying, Jesus says, everybody can eat. And the producer says, no, everybody can't eat. It's going to cost too much. <laughs> right. You know? One and sandwich it- a piece, everybody. <laughs> Exactly. It was like really difficult to, to do that stuff. But at the same time, you know, if I ever added up how much I made making these shows, I mean, I swear a lot of I don't even make a dollar an hour, you know, um, but I wasn't really doing it. It's very brilliant and very rewarding. If you can make money doing your own craft, it doesn't have to be a lot. As long as you can survive, you're fine with it. You don't need to be you know, a millionaire and have all this stuff, as long as you can make money and survive doing what you love to do. And that, by the way, if you're a gourmet hamburger maker, that's really cool too. Right. Because you're doing what you believe in. Um, And if you like working at McDonald's and you really love it, that is cool too. You know, it's, you just got to be passionate about whatever you do. And I think that opens up the world to put you every, I believe every, Every couple of years is like a step to heaven to reach your ultimate goal, which is obviously where you're satisfied and you let go and then you become the super incredible human being or whatever sure. in, in heaven. So it's really important that you really care about what you do. And if you, and I understand you've got to do, I used to dig ditches. Okay. So, I mean, I know, I know how it is, but I always used it for a reason you know, uh, to get to a better place, a a stepping stone. I need to dig the stitch so that I can go and do what I want to do. So I'm going to really do a good job doing it, you know? Oh, trust me. We've we've played in so many dumps. (laughs) It's like you get to, you're sitting there going. I'm sure you will will play in many more. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I miss those days playing live because I was a singer, a lead singer. Oh, yeah. I I bet they loved you. I missed it, you know, but I, I, I am um, still do. I still, I'm still in a studio doing music and I still love it. And, um, you know, became a writer. I've written a few books now, which have been, a, I, you know, I did, um, Robert, a, a couple of months back and I just released it. I did a book called Paranoia, the strange case of a ghost, demons and aliens, which I did pretty well. And it's like an autobiography of rock and roll, 
it's a sex ghost in rock and roll, really. <laughs> Sweet. But um, it's done very deep and spiritual in the sense that, it, you, you know, you feel it's very positive. It's a very positive book. And that's a lot of the story of you and, and a lot of the experiences you've had in entertainment and uh, paranormal stuff? Yeah, everything. Entertainment, the rock and roll days to the playing Jesus, my mom dying of cancer right after I played Jesus, and I was very enlightened. I was, I was crucified in a rock and roll, Guns N' Roses type music video, so they crucified me. Okay. But the, problem, the problem is when they were crucifying me on the music video, in my psyche, it felt like it really was happening. So when I came off of the cross, everything seemed different to me. And it was really weird. And I don't know what it was, but even it was like a epitome for just a moment. It was enough to make me appreciate life so much more to the fact um, I was able to help my mom pass of ovarian cancer, which she died terribly of. And I was so enlightened after doing that music video. She wasn't afraid to let go. And I was 33 at the time, which was you know, Jesus', Jesus. age, right. So it's pretty, I mean, pretty trippy, you know, it really is. <laughs> that's, a par- that's, a powerful, uh, that's a powerful story, you know, that you're doing something very emotional. Obviously, uh, you know, you're playing a role that's very emotional. And, we, you know, we make a joke about those glam rock videos and stuff like that, right? But yeah. you're doing something that, you know, you feel is important, artistic, emotional. You're, you're carrying it through on the, on the set. You know, you're taping it and everything, and or I mean, video uh, filming it, and you're carrying through it, and then you have those feelings, and then you reach a different level in your head that enables you to do something wonderful for something someone you love. That's an awesome story. Thank you very much, and and, and um, it also helped me deal with the pain because obviously losing your mom is terrifically um, destructive. So at that point, I've always learned that when something destructive comes in, you must turn it into creativity. I think. Uh, when our mom did pass, we were making a movie at the time that it happened. Um, I got really upset that day. I, I fired everybody. I was a producer at that time on a movie. But it was devastating. But, I mean, I tried to, you know, my, I remember the phone call from our mom saying, now, don't you go falling apart when I die. Don't go falling apart. You know, how are you supposed to deal with that? <laughs> right. You know, you're going to go falling apart. So I tried to think that every time, that I get sad that I go ahead and create something and create something out of destruction. And we are still doing it today, but I was saying that I went ahead and turned that book, which is a great book. It's a, um, almost 200 pages. And it's like, a, um, I turned it into an audio book and I, I never done an audio book before, but I wanted to tell the story myself. So I went ahead and narrated and then I put music behind it with sound effects of all these stories, some of these stories I've been telling you today are in that book. And it turned out so great. I mean, it turned out so well. It's like a Pink Floyd album, you know, in narration. <laughs> and it turned out so cool that I just love doing that. And I, I hope to do many more um, of that. But, but uh, yeah, so. That's called like Paranoia, the audio experience or something, or an audio that's experience? That's correct, yeah. It's on iTunes, it's on Amazon, and it's on spooktv.com which is my webs, which is our own website and also all my other books. I also put another book out, which actually was to correspond with, um, remember the Exorcism Live that uh, Destination America did? Yeah, so, okay, let's talk about that. I wanted to ask you about that for a second, because that was right before, now, uh, so everybody out there, like I met uh, Christopher at the the Chicago uh, Ghost Conference last year, and he put on a, a cool presentation. And so Allison, who you guys have heard on the podcast before a thousand times, my sister, who runs Milwaukee Ghosts, was super excited because she already already had a couple of documentaries and Skinwalkers and everything, and and she's been working on this um, Wisconsin Exorcist, and so she needed to she needed to pick up a copy of, and it's it's like the Secret Diary of the Exorcist, right? Uh, it's called, no, actually it's called the Exorcist Diary. The yeah, Exorcist yeah, Diary. Yeah. And you guys did this um, special on Halloween last year, and I remember seeing the updates and checking it out. It was great. Uh, but t- how? So how did you guys get that special? Let's talk about that for a second. Well, it wasn't my special. Basically, the um, um, the producers of uh, the Ghost Asylum B series on Destination America asked me to um, bring in my uh, feelings on 
the movie, the motion picture, the exorcist and what it has had. Um, we did our own movie, a documentary called the exorcist fire, which went out on red box, which did well on red box. And, um, is on iTunes and on Hulu right now. Oh, cool. And um, you might want to check that out because actually we're getting ready to pull all them down because uh, actually I'll tell you at the very end of this, I have a special announcement to tell you guys, which is great. But uh, anyway, I like that we too. made our own show and it was basically, we were the first ones ever to film inside the real Exodus house and do a paranormal investigation and tell you the truth as well as, well as um in, interview the real family of the boy it was a boy not a girl that it happened to and the real exorcist uh, family we put it all together and called this documentary the exorcist file and they wanted me to um you know talk about that as well as talk about the movie exorcist as well as bring a copy of the real diary and i have a copy of the real diary so and this is the diary of the, this is the diary of the priest doing the exorcism yeah, the 14 priests wrote about what really happened. And it's, it's um, awakening and it's scary, but it's also really cool to know what happened, you know, the, the truth of, behind the movie. So I turned that into a book, and um, it's actually perfect timing. It came out right after that special, which had 1.2 million viewers, I think, wow. on it, came out. And... Um, I got to revisit, we were the first there, we got to revisit the house. And it hadn't actually gotten 10 times worse as far as, you know, bad vibes in that house, bad energy. Um, so it wasn't really enjoyable to go back in that house in any way. How does the crew feel on this? Like, I mean, as a producer, as the vision behind it and stuff like that, like you have a, you have a compelling interest, like we're going to go check out this place with bad vibes and it's going to be, but how do you, you know, you bring like a, a boom operator or something. And how does that guy feel? Well, a lot of them, you know, well, first of all, everybody on that show was beautiful and it was a discovery uh, channel production of destination America's ghost asylum, uh, exorcism live. And they were all great people. All of them. Discovery was great. Destination America was great. Tremendous entertainment. The production company Ghost Sign was great. Very caring people. I mean, I have to really mention that because it was a weird thing that they were doing, you know, going in to exercise a house, uh, get rid of a bad energy that happened there in, in 1949. And um, they had the crew, and there was a lot of crew. There was probably close to, I think, at least 100, not 150 people there. Wow. Crew members. And there were, Two huge satellite trucks, I mean, actually semi-trailers. There was, you know, makeup, props, uh, um, dressing room, grip trucks, cameras, and everything. I mean, it was a huge production, and it was a live event. So you can times that by two when you do live, because you need the live trucks there as well. Right. So it was probably almost like a football field full of people and trucks and equipment all to do this little house. (laughs) Well, I just, I just imagine like just some dude, you know, like a, like a PA or something like that. It's like, Oh God, like there's like, I'm I'm terrified. The place is given bad vibes. They're talking about the devil and I'm getting scale for this. Like this isn't worth it. Well, they did do, some of them did do that. Some got very scared and a lot of them refused to go into the house. (laughs) So, um, yeah, it had, it had that energy about it. It definitely, Nobody felt that it was a good place. No, so this was last year when they did this live thing. How long ago did you guys do the Exorcist file? 2010. Okay, so just a, just about five, six years ago. And so you're in there, and was there a regular family living in the house now, or is it? Yeah, there was a uh, um, a gentleman, and recently he has, I think, a fiance now that lives there. And did they know about like the history and stuff like that, or did you? Did, did you were you the one to tell them like, hey, didn't mean to weird you out or anything like that, but some really crazy stuff went down here. Well, um, again, a lot of this is in my book Paranoia, and also in the Exodus Diary book, which is at SpookTV.com, and also you can see, uh, you know, uh, on Spook TV, you can get the Exodus um, file, which is our movie about it. But the man that bought the house knew 
knew it was the Exodus House, and he bought it for that reason. Ah. And he bought it on six six o six. Perfect. He doesn't believe in it at all. Um, but for some reason, he wanted the house blessed. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. Was, uh, <laughs> well, that's that's great. And my sister Allison was saying that she really enjoyed. Uh, the Exorcist Diary, and that she couldn't, you know, she, she she thought it was well written and well done. So everybody, make sure uh, to check that out if you're looking for the real story behind the fictional story that uh, made us all uh, pee our pants when we were ten years old. No, what's looking next for for you guys? That you're still you're still at it, you're still doing it. What's the next kind of step? If you just had this book come out and you had Paranoia and the audio book of it come out, what's your next uh, you know visual video production that people are gonna be able to check out? Um, I just released a new book, um, just to get up uh, on that one. Oh, please. A, a, a book called Angel or Devil, and your sister might like that one too. Basically, it is um, it explores two of America's first possessions in exorcism. Not the exorcist one, but actually the other two. One that happened in 1877 that our movie The Possessed is based on, but this is a book form now. And one that nobody's ever touched, which I'm actually we're green lighting and making a movie about it, but it's about an exorcism that happened in 1928. And it's about a legion of demons inhabit a young girl brought to a, I mean, scary place, a convent for an exorcism. And in this convent, um, disturbing and extraordinary events lash out because we, they find out the family has a past of dark magic and has created a curse that is seven times evil. And the point is, this is a true story. And uh, the movie um, Emily Rose and even The Exorcist was based off of a lot of the um, events that happened in this story. Oh, that's Nine, awesome. Eight, including where the girl's hanging on the ceiling, upside down kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That happened in this, uh, and this is a journal. It's not necessarily, this book I have is actually my book but it's got the real journals in it so you can read the real of what happened like oh my god really it's really cool and what this is um it really pushes on is what happens if the exorcism doesn't work Mm. okay and then meaning that you exercise somebody okay you know she or he's healed and then a few years later they become repossessed well, if you look at that concept, even back into the biblical terms of that, if you get repossessed, the next time you get possessed after having a, an exorcism, the evil is seven times worse. Mm. I thought that was an incredible concept and idea. That yeah, it's terrifying. Times, it is. It's terrifying. And that's the kind of stuff we do. So that's in a book called Angel or Devil. And that's at spooktv.com. And we have actually um, limited editions, which are autographed and numbered. We have like, I, I think, 10 of those left. And um, that's Angel Adele at spooktv.com. I've seen that graphics for it and stuff like that. It looks really cool. I didn't know that actual story behind it. That, that's great the, uh, that you went into that 1928 exorcism. And it's something that hasn't been explored as much. And so I think that's a, that's a fun thing. What city did that happen in? Iowa. In uh, Erling, Iowa, state of Iowa, um, and it's a true story. And that church is still there. So, as a researcher, and I know we're running out of time here, so I want to. So, and I know you you've been doing this research for years and stuff. But how do you get your hands on like a a journal done by like an exorcist or some nuns? I just know a lot of people, and a lot of uh, people that believe that we will handle it right. That we'll tell the true story and we won't embellish it. Everything we've done, we haven't embellished it. I mean, Death Tunnel, yeah, but that was a that was a fictional movie. But Spook was was nonfiction. And right. Everything we did was nonfiction. Um, the movie we did for Sci Fi Dead Still, which is still on Sci Fi Channel uh, last year, is about a haunted Victorian camera, and that's is based on true events. So you, if you if you see the movie Dead Still on Sci Fi, that's all movie. But, oh, awesome. Uh, so, and uh, so I'm, we're going on the road, and of course we're doing Penthurst Paracon on June 4th and 5th in, in Penthurst, which is incredible, down in Pennsylvania. 
Then we're heading to the Haunted Farm in Walton, Kentucky on July 16th. Fandom Fest in Louisville, 29th and 31st of July. Silcon, August 20th. Uh, Saturday night, we're doing Ashmore Estates on August 20th. Then the 100th birthday of Ashmore Estates in September, 9th to 10th, which is incredible, uh, the 100th birthday of that one. And October 2nd, Scare Fest. Chicago Con after that, which we're doing Chicago Con again, October 7th and 9th, where I met you. And mm-hmm. then after that, we're doing a live Paranormal Con in Pennsylvania on October 29th to Halloween. And then, of course, the cool thing is that we have just um, um, uh, licensed four of our films to Destination America. Oh, congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah, and Discovery Channel. And they will be, I've told, that they will be playing through Ghosttober <laughs> this year. Cool. Okay? So you get to see um, uh, we're releasing four films that have been re-edited and remastered. Four of our best uh, shows are being going to be airing on Destination America coming up in October. Well, congrats! That's that's awesome news, and it's like sounds oh, it you guys are having a super busy summer and, and Halloween season this year, so that's exciting. Yeah, I mean, like I keep doing it. And, of course, my, my favorite thing I'm looking forward to is my little boy, Gabriel, who's uh, nine years old, coming to visit me for summer. Oh, that sounds and nice. I get, take, I get to take 30 days off and, and uh, pinch his t- cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And so people can find all your stuff at spooktv.com. Yeah, and I'm on Facebook, Christian St. Booth on Facebook. Uh, our streaming videos on spooktv-od.com. Spooktv-od.com is our own streaming channel. Uh, our movies are up there um, streaming, of course. Destination America. we got four new shows coming out. That's this, awesome. Uh, this October. So. so make sure you guys get out there. Uh, all the links will be up in the show notes at othersidepodcast.com slash 91. We'll have links directly where you can check out all their stuff but make sure you keep supporting and watch it when it's on um, because it's always good to see like independent exciting uh, filmmakers who have a visual eye um, and fellow musicians who are out there exploring this paranormal world and making stuff for you guys so thank you very much for spending your time with uh, t- day with us Chris thank you very much God bless everybody all right we'll see you again bye bye such an interesting perfect crossover between the paranormal and yeah. pop culture i mean it's like he was meant to be on our podcast i think he was i think he was <laughs> just an, a guy that leads an interesting life yeah and you know? the two of you talking together too like i could tell his interests were very in line with what the stuff that you dig so yeah, <laughs> yeah so i had a lot to lot to say to him so anyway i'm looking forward to checking out his newest stuff and the, mm-hmm. the stuff he's talking about on destination america and everything um so make sure you check out his website and things like that and uh, see, I what, will. see what Spooked TV has in store. <laughs> and I'm sure we're going to see him again, too. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait. Absolutely. Very cool. So uh, inspiration behind this song is that um, Christopher was really talking about, like, you know, how to live your life with passion and how when he felt like he was selling out or when he was selling his talents short, that, he, mm-hmm. that, that was when he decided to move on and try different things. Yeah. And if he didn't have those feelings, he wouldn't have started on paranormal wow stuff in the first place. look at that so cool. this song kind of relates to that that okay. feeling of like if you're going to do something you know don't don't quit and, and right. uh, you know you can go with your instincts yeah <laughs> like you know you, you you can't sell out because you end up losing a piece of your soul mm-hmm. and so this song is called the wilderness of almost was and never were Oh, my.
Thank you for listening to today's episode. You can find us online at othersidepodcast.com. Until next time, see you on the other side. What did I get myself into? Like, this is going to be my big break if I survive.